So the Board of Education uh, Policy Committee for June 1st, 2020 is, uh, is coming to order. Um, and we have uh, a, few, a few items on the agenda for today. Um, the first is uh, a search and seizure policy that is um, being considered for first reading. Um, we have one policy in public comment period, workplace harassment, and, um, and then we have uh, policies for discussion. Um, we've received um, some recommendations from OSBA that we wanna consider. And uh, finally, public comment. Uh, Kara, um, can you tell me if anybody has signed up for public comment? No. Okay. Okay, uh, so let's start with the search and seizure policy. Um, so the, the version we're looking at is the May 28th, 2020 draft, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, so as you all know, this policy has been uh, kind of in the works for quite a long time. And I am hopeful that we can start moving this towards a uh, full board consideration. Um, we have talked about, I think, a, a number of the changes, um, but can, can somebody remind me? We, um, I, so I printed out a copy and me, we have- I, I can walk you through the changes that were requested from the last meeting, uh, if okay. you'd like that. Read okay, so can I just clarify? So we have some changes in purple, at least on my copy. Some of them are purple, some of them are blue, some of them are yes. red. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, do you know offhand what the different colors mean? Are they different iterations of this? Uh, some are diff. So some are input from other people. Um, the purple are my changes, uh, but from earlier on, and then, um, and then later iterations, uh, you can see is, are the, the deletions. Okay. Um, but I can walk you through, because I think that's easier, and, and I'm, I, I will, I think with every meeting, apologize for my lack of proficiency with the Google. Um, to give you a clear, cleaner copy. Kara and Rachel helped me last time, but, um, and so I, I think I'm gonna re rely on their help in the future. But what I was asked to do, and uh, I'll, I'll take you to the very end of the document because uh, the first thing we were asked to do was to, to put the definition section at the end, which is what we did. And while there, we were asked to um, make, a um, more user-friendly definition of reasonable suspicion, mm -hmm. uh, which is what we attempted to do in that first, in that 5A. So um, if you wanna look through that to see if there are any other, uh, if that looks uh, acceptable to you or if it looks like it, it needs further amendment, we can do that. Um, can I can I make a copy editing suggestion? Always, yes. Um, I think it might be helpful to put in bold face um, or or italics somehow signify what the term is that is being defined. Yes, I can do that. So with reasonable suspicion, interview by law enforcement, parent guardian, imminent threat. Yes. I'll put those in bold, if that, does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Okay, 
Does that, um, uh, do you have any questions about the definition section or any, any uh, other amendments? Um, they sound good to me. Um, Amy, do you have any comments? Yeah, I'm good. Um, okay. And then, so the next one, it was, a. Um, I think it would, I think what happened was in the, the many iterations it got lost, but under four, parent guardian notice, I was asked, we had language that parents need to provide consent prior to an interview, but that got lost in the middle of the paragraph. So we were at, I was asked to put it up on top. So it now reads parents or guardians shall also be notified and must provide consent before any law enforcement conducts any an interview of a student who is the subject of an investigation taking place on district premises. Okay, um, is that another term of art, subject of an investigation? Yes. Should that be defined? Um, we can do that, I can do that. Um, this was to separate that because I do, th that this is, I, and again, this is where we started, um, was those, there are um, greater, uh, criminal protections for those um, those who are the subject of an investigation. Right. Um, but I can define that. Okay. The last change, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, um, are, are there any um, further thoughts on paragraph four? And Mary, I'll just note, right, there are two fours, like we have to fix the. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, yes. Yeah. 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 Sorry about that. The, 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 uh, the yeah. parent guardian notice um, section. Sorry, I'll clarify that. Yeah. I just want to say I really appreciate the way this has turned out because I think it's it's what we want. We it, it's taking in all that input of we want to make sure that while the school is serving in local parentis that parents are notified and give consent. And then there are the things of like I think I really appreciate the way you've put in that language around not deterring students and then also making sure we're clear about when it's a um, child abuse situation. Um, is there any part in here? about the imminent threat? Yes, it's the final, it's the uh, final sentence, or no, the second to last sentence. Though in situations where there is an imminent threat, I don't know why I didn't see that. There may not so be you see, yeah. notify you. Yeah, got it, perfect, thank you. Okay. And then the other thing that I was asked to look at is, and again, thanks Liz, the, tra the numbering system is wrong, but it says tracking system. And, and um, there was a request to clarify what exactly we were tracking, since we do track a lot of demographic information. But what was, and Shanice can speak to this, what, um, what students in particular were interested in were the number of searches that didn't lead to anything, you know, because that's the indicator of bias. Who's being searched, you know, where, who is being searched in total? And then as opposed to just, you know, what are the incidences of discipline? And so uh, we tried to capture that with the tracking system should include demographic information on the searches conducted by each school and other indicators which will help to identify, analyze, and monitor disparities. Well, will that also indicate what it is that was being searched for, like the object of the search? Um, 
So I saw that Russ had joined us in this meeting and I, I'll let him talk about that because I none of this has been developed. I think this is this is what is being um, this is what you are requesting and what from um, input from students and families. But I'll let Russ talk to that piece of what can be um, tracked. I'm putting him on the spot. <laughs> so. Is he still there? Maybe he's not there. I thought I saw him. Uh, he, he was. Russ, are you still on the call? I don't, uh, see, him, but... I don't see him. I don't see him. Okay. Um, I think um, I, I think you you don't have the subject matter experts on the call who can tell you how to build the system. What we can do is take the direction from the committee and then take it back but we're, we're poor substitutes on how it will work and uh, what it will look like so I think you guys set the policy and then other people who are smarter than Mary and uh, I am are going to have to go figure that out <laughs> Mary I'm just getting us off the hook because you, know, you don't do that so I think it would be helpful to in addition to the demographic info uh -huh. on on which students mm -hmm. um i think it would also be helpful to know what it is they're being searched for okay and esther uh, i see that you're here and there may be um no pressure, but I, I invite you if there if you want to think about the implementation of that at the building level. I think you have a perspective that's different than what Mary and I have, and it's also different than Russ has. And if you don't want to weigh in, I totally understand that too. So, um, what was your question regarding what you wanted me um, to weigh in on? Well, I think I had been, uh, we're talking about the tracking system, and I had suggested that in addition to the demographic information on the students um, being tracked, that we might also want to track what it is the students were being searched for. Uh, and you're uh, speaking to the academic experience, right? Um, well, this is... Um, this is on the search and seizure policy, and we're we're trying to figure out how we can build a tracking system, and um, that will allow kind of an annual report on what's happening in the schools in terms of search and seizure. So, for instance, in this question, it, do you always know what you're searching for when you when you start, or do you report on what you found at the end? Right? I, Those I are different see. ways to define what's being searched for. I have no idea which makes more sense or how you would want to capture that, or how much detail you want to put in the policy about that. I, I think that it is best that you identify what it is you're searching for in the beginning, because if you have to wait till the end, then anything goes, right? But if you start out in the beginning, then the chances are you're going to focus on what it is you're looking for instead of just look randomly looking for stuff and then turning around and claiming that's what you were searching for. So well, I think and, and, and that's the legal standard too, right? That's the reasonable position you're talking about. Is you have to be able to, when asked at the front end, I am looking, I have a belief based on the information that I've received that there is this being held by this student. Yes, absolutely. But absolutely. you may also find other things. So I you may also in the course of it, but and, and it doesn't detract if you find other things. Like as we've seen, there have been cases where uh, an administrator receives information that a student has drug paraphernalia. When the student then volunteers to or you know opens up their backpack, there's also there has been not often, thankfully, but occasionally a gun. You didn't seek out the gun but you still right. had the reasonable suspicion for the pot when it was there right and right. i think that's we, how it should be i think we should state it up front yeah because we're i mean we're supposed to have an articulable reasonable suspicion right so yeah, yeah. So, so
so on that particular piece, and it doesn't have to be before. If I don't know if we're setting this out for a uh, first first reading or a second first reading, but I would like to have Papsa weigh in on that um, because I don't. I, I wonder if there's a point where they're like, this is a search, so this is going to be something that I record versus. Like I happened to look in the backpack and I saw that. And does that get recorded? I just think we should get some building level um, feedback on how they do them so that, because you may have different definitions of a search. And so, hey, it looks like Benson's doing them all the time. And is that because actually kids have more things that they need to be searched for than say at Grant where there's hardly any because then none of them were reported, but it may just be there's like a different standard for what a search is is or and when it should be defined so I, I guess at some point in time on the implementation i would hope that principals or school administrators would weigh in directly i was i really did think that you had to have reasonable evidence or reason to conduct a search anyway you know it can't just be random mm -hmm. And I think yeah. that's the building level response also, unless if it's different here. No. It's okay. Right. Uh, okay, but it, it does bring up a question. Um, do we need to define what constitutes a search? Well, I, I, let me look to the, I think it, Talk about it. Uh, I'm going to recommend not. Um, we talk about it in, in, in one of the threes. If you look at the top of the right, what they're searching, right. Miss Liz, I'm curious as to why you'd recommend not. Not defining search? Yes. Um, I'm shooting from the hip a little bit, so uh, bear with me on it. But I think it's, if you start defining search, then you're going to have yet another place. Reasonable suspicion is really important, right? Do I have, do I have an articulable basis to go take the act. If I start paring down search, then you have then you have the potential for most likely misunderstanding or occasionally gamesmanship about well that wasn't a search so I didn't have to have reasonable suspicion because that was slightly different than how search is defined and I think search is fairly uh, there's a there's a pretty good understanding of what a search is and isn't. I want to go into a locker, a backpack. Uh, your pocket, you know, I mean, what all, all the things that that you have, we've defined, here's what I'm going to go uh, see what you got in there. And I okay. worry about all the different ways people fight about was it or wasn't it a search if you start defining it with too much particularity. And I welcome pushback on that. But that's my instinct. So I'm not a criminal law. I'm not a criminal lawyer by training. So, um, which is where all of this stuff comes from in the case law. Okay. So having been a site level administrator, um, and this is drawing from my experience, there are certain um, pieces that need to be present when it is a search. So, for example, you'd have an administrator there, maybe an AP. Um, you'd have maybe the police officer or the school campus security officer. You know, and then you'd have the student, you know, so there is a process that defines it as a search that makes it a search. So that's why I was wondering if those are the same um, parameters that we have, then maybe we don't need to define it. But if it isn't, then maybe we need to loosely define it to just say, if there are these certain characteristics, then you could consider that to be a search. I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, no, it's the right question. I think we do have more of that process built into the administrative directive, I see. Esther. So instead of defining what is or isn't the search, we've said if you're going to do a search using a pretty reasonable understanding of that, here are the pieces that have to go with it, including other witnesses and. Um, yeah. It's the process. So, there, so I think you're spot on. We just have taken that's not in the policy as much as it's in the AD about who has to be present. Perfect. Okay, then that well, then I'm good. Okay. 
Okay, um, I, I have another question about in this section under searches. Um, you talk a lot about non-student property, but you don't mention student property. The student property doesn't come in until process. The, the second number four. Unless I've missed it somewhere. Well, okay, and in, in the second paragraph, you say conduct searches of students and student property. Well, because those are the defined pieces that in which there is an expectation of privacy in student and student property, but district property does not have the same expectation. Right. But we can still we can still search student property with reasonable suspicion, right? Yes. So, um, I'm just I, I, I'm just puzzled why you don't have a sentence in there, or you don't specifically call out under searches that student property can be searched as well. Well, there's so in conducting a search of student or student property, a school official SAP. I'll do the following. Rita, covered in that in that portion there on number three, those first two paragraphs. I mean, the, the second paragraph lays out that there's no expectation of privacy in the district property, but you can conduct the first paragraph talks about the search of. Yeah, okay, all right, okay. Yeah. okay, all right, never mind. Sorry, missed it. Sorry. Okay. Okay. We've been over it so many times. It's I. And yeah, there's yeah, yeah. Tricks on you after a while. I couldn't find the sentence about Im imminent threat in the paragraph I was looking at. So I think we're all okay. Yeah. And I've given you multiple threes and fours. So look at me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so so we've gone through a couple of things. Um do we need to talk about the um, the purple second paragraph under purpose? I think we've already seen this, haven't we? Yes, that was there. That's not new since the last meeting. Right. Okay, and um, and I think the racial equity social justice framework was also there the last time, right? It was. Yes, okay. that was the work done um, uh, by Danny and Maxine um, a few months ago, based on the based on the input from Shanice. Okay, so so I think that covers the the new changes, the most recent changes. Um, are there any questions from board members? So if if we're going to um, have the change in the reporting, the only thing are, are you into, are we are we sending this out for first reading or or where are we in the process? It has not been first read yet, or if it okay. has, it has to be re first read. I can't remember honestly if we did it once and it came back. But the next step for the board is a first reading. Okay, so th this is not a impediment um, to having a first reading. It's just on the reporting. I'd I'd like to just have a couple principals eyeball it and tell us what what we're missing or whether we're creating some new reporting monster f for them. Do you mean on the tracking system? Yes. Given we're supposed to be reducing initiatives, because I'm assuming that the principals are the only ones to do it. And I don't know like what that would look like if it's a you know two minute, you click a couple boxes and you're done. Or it's like you got to fill out a form and I don't know how often it happens. So I guess 
I just want to so, get, so again, it's what, not, it's not a deal breaker and we don't have to deal with it now. I just would like to make sure that we're not adding on something that is not, it, it's uh, time intensive that maybe is not getting us, you know, a whole lot more information. Well, I don't think the tracking system has been designed yet, right? Isn't that right? Correct. Okay. I mean, there is a, there are tracking. There's tracking of discipline already occurring. So there are some some uh, and discipline by you know demographically broken out, and I think also by school. Yes, by school, but not um, this this search, this specific search piece. Right. So part of me, my hand is raised. I was just um, going to ask, what would be the purpose of the tracking? I think if we go to the purpose, then we know if we need to add it or if we can just, um, if we need to create a separate process for it. What would be the purpose? What would we be looking for if we're asking to track? Well, I think what we've heard from students is that um, A number of students have reported that they feel they have been targeted for um, searches without reasonable cause. I see. And, and some sentiment, uh, uh, certainly a perception that the searches are being um, disproportionately conducted on students of color. Okay. Um, and there appears to be some uh, lack of consistency and reliability in the way um, searches are being reported by school. I see. Okay. Okay. Did I get that right, everybody? Okay. Yep. Thank you. Okay. So, um, so uh, if, if I've been keeping track of this, so we want to add one definition on subject of investigation. Yes. How, how do we define that? Um, and then I think, and Julia wanted some principles to take a look at it. Um, I, I will just say, this is my perspective, that um, I believe this may be, and an additional reporting requirement for principals. But I think uh, assuming we can develop a tracking system that will be reasonably, you know, that'll be uh, kind of user friendly and understandable and, and not excessively burdensome. Um, I think this is worth doing. Yeah. So, I, just, just to be clear, I, I'm not, I don't have any uh, philosophical or issue with it. I just think they're 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 the reporters, and it would be we probably could get some useful information um, on how to do it effectively and efficient efficiently. Um, so well, again, I, not an impediment to a first reading. I just think it would be be helpful, and I would be curious of what they said because we've heard this well, we, we've heard the searches or the potential searches point of view. Right, but I, I think that is, um, I think once we do this policy, then we hand it over to staff, and I would expect staff to be including principals, you know, the, the ultimate users of this in, um, in discussions around designing the system. And, and we've already started, I mean, we've been designing those systems um, in, in response to last year, the, 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 the uh, in response to the contraband issue, we were trying to develop a procedure to protect administrators um, by having a, we didn't have a, a, a strong process in place. And so there's now a, we have a kind of reporting and a, I mean, I, I'm also like, as we create this tracking system, um, you know, I think it might be helpful to have something in there about an annual board review or, I mean, it's great to have the tracking system and be, be looking, 
but it's like who's looking and then who's doing something about it. Um, I think those are the pieces I'm interested in. And I think one of the things we've raised earlier is that, that the people who students maybe feel are targeting certain groups of students are the ones that are doing the reporting. So there is a little bit of how are we going to sort of track the tracking. Um, kind of my question, and again, I think that's a staff question as we live into this, but I'd like us to, as a board, to have it on our radar that this is something we need to touch back and look at in a year um, so that we're aware of what is it showing us about how um, search and seizures are being used in our um, school community. Right. Well, uh, under tracking system, it says that um, there's going to be an annual report to the board. Um, which, but, but that reminds me, um, uh, under tracking system, um, I think we want to add, in, a, in addition to demographic, demographic information, we also want to add the cause of the search. The, the item searched for was what we said. Is that cause, cause or is that something different? Um, no, I, I think the item being searched for, yeah. Yeah. So okay. what is, yeah. They had a reasonable suspicion of something. What was the something? Okay, right. we got that. I just want to make sure we're talking about the same thing. Yes. yes. Okay, so um, I think that's all we've got for this version. So here's a question to my colleagues on the board. Um, do we think... Um, are, are we willing to give this back to the staff, asking them to make these two changes? Um, and it, do, do we need to take another crack at it at an, another meeting or do we feel comfortable um, letting them make the changes, run it past us, but put it on the agenda for the next board meeting? I'm comfortable as long as we get the threes and fours sorted. Yes. <laughs> I don't care about the threes and fours. Um, so <laughs> I, I, I'm comfortable with that. I guess the one thing that, and I raised it at the, at the last board meeting, is before we, you know, launch another um, policy out into first reading, I feel like we... Um, it, we're, we're sort of launching it into the the atmosphere and then 21 days, days later it's like we didn't hear from anybody so we're going to move ahead um i think we something like this which is a substantive policy is um other than just we post we talked about the meeting we posted it and then okay we're good i, I i'd like a a um a sort of in the in the virtual in the environment in which we're in what are we doing differently because it's not it's not the same as a board meeting or i just i think we're we're most people have no idea that we've got a, a a policy there that unless they watch the board meeting and they go into our website and click go about four clicks in to see the draft policy so i'm um i'm wondering if there's a mechanism that we could just like hey these are the you know eight groups that we think are going to be interested whether it's parents and student groups um just to get it out there like please give us your comments and if we don't hear anything then we've done you know more of our due diligence okay can i can i um just add here um so i no longer remember when we started to look at this policy but i, I believe it was about a year ago and I think um, one of the reasons, a, a big reason why it's taken so long to develop this policy is precisely because there was a great deal of um, effort put into consulting with affected communities. Right, Shanice? Am I right? Um, thank you, uh, Director Moore. I, I definitely would add, you know, especially as we did the second round of engagement um, after Danny with the support of Maxine and other students, 
um, kind of gave us uh, some more uh, clarity around how we can make another feedback loop, uh, particularly with students. So I think around the second time uh, uh, COVID kind of was starting uh, the in the middle of that, but we ended up engaging more students the second time around after kind of processing than even in the beginning. So I think we're, we're looking at about 600 folks, which isn't a lot, but ultimately more than um, I think I've historically seen uh, through, throughout engaging in, 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 in decision making in the district. So I think it's an incredible amount of students who are able to share feedback and, uh, and work with our team. I think there could be a, exactly to uh, Director Rim Edwards' point, having some targeted conversations, I think makes a lot of sense. And that can be a nice layer to have in addition to um, just making it accessible in the ways that we already are. But I would offer that people people who uh, who who are reaching will will give us feedback, and you know, as I connect with community, I'm hearing that they're watching our live streams and engaging and hearing about uh, what's happening with updates. And so I'm confident that uh, you know, if we add a, an, another layer like Director Brim Edwards is suggesting of engagement, um, that it it should be okay. It shouldn't. It shouldn't have to be too uh, much of, a, a, of an effort this last time around since we did have this extensive amount of work um, that has led us, uh, led us to where we are. Okay, so, um, so what would be your recommendation to do that before we send it to the board for first reading or after? Good question. Um, I think having the intention in place to do that work and then before the policy is voted on, just having a sense of what feedback exists in a collective sense, um, and maybe not maybe not focusing on this as maybe a, a formal effort, but we can uh, absolutely set up some meetings, some focus groups that we have in some targeted communities. And I don't think it needs to uh, happen before it goes to a first reading, but I would just say before before it's voted on, of course. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess so I would just, if you don't mind, um, just I want to um, recognize, Shanice, all the work that you did, because I think we have a better policy before that. Um, I don't think it needs to go back to anybody in particular before we have a first reading. Maybe it's at the first reading is like, thank you for providing input. Here's, you know, the policy that the board has under consideration. And especially when we I have listened to people and I incorporated feedback, I think it's very affirming for people to see that. And maybe they look at it and like, hey, you didn't, you took three of my things, but not this other one. Um, and we can talk about why we didn't take the other one um, versus like, hey, I wonder what they did with my feedback. <laughs> right. um, so I, again, it's, it's not at all meant to be a barrier or to not recognize the feedback that I already went in. I've got to say in the last like three days, I've had more questions about um, law enforcement in the schools. Uh, so it just seems like it's yeah. worth dispersing it out and I think I think we have a, a good work product and that's in many cases due to you know Shanice your conversations with students in the community okay so um, so I'm going to I'm going to take that to mean that um, we think uh, with the changes that have been suggested, um, we think this can be put on the agenda for the next board meeting um, for a first reading. Um, and then the 21 day clock will start and um, Denise, you can kind of re-engage with the critical people you think we, we need to check back with. Um, I think my only uh, my only request is um, to, 
I, I think it would be good if we could get this policy on the book before the end of this school year. Um, because it, if we have, if, if we have um, in-person classes next fall, um, it would be important to have um, some... Hey, Roseanne, can you mute yourself? We're getting a lot of background noise. Kara took care okay. of it. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, well, someone's doing the dishes. That's good. Um, <laughs> Um, so anyway, yes, so if we could, um, it would be ideal, I think, if we could get some some of that feedback within that 21 day window. And that way we could um, get this taken care of by the end of June, which I think would make everyone's life easier. Because the, the, um, this may not be a perfect policy, but I think it's fair to say it is a better policy than the one that currently exists on the book. So, okay. All right. Yeah. So, um, so last question about this. Um, Mary and Liz, when do you think you can get us the, the revision? I think they need to be done before Thursday so that they can go in the board packet on Thursday. That's what Roseanne okay. would like me to say. So. I think we're going to make it happen before right then. Answer, Liz. <laughs> what? That, that is the right answer. Yes. Okay. So, so my question is, is that doable? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, so when we get the, when we get these changes, when we get the next version, I'm going to ask um, the two board members to take a look at it immediately because if there are any issues, we can pull it from the agenda if necessary, but we would need to know almost immediately. Okay? Okay. All right. Cool. I'm doing some progress. Good. Um, okay, next item. Um, policies and public comment period, workplace harassment. Have we gotten any comments? We have not. Okay. Um, do you know when the when does the twenty one day clock end on that one? Um, I believe it's a week from. I think it's a week from tomorrow. Is that right? Okay. And then so we're scheduled to read it at the last board meeting of the year on the twenty. Okay. Okay. Didn't okay, we read good. it on the twenty sixth? I did not read it to not read uh, both votes on it. Right. Well, okay. I think the yeah. last part of the year is the answer. So, yeah. So I have a, I have a question. Did we just given it, it deals with workplace harassment and I know it just incorporates the, the changes from the, the law. Um, but I, my guess is most employees aren't, weren't following what happened in the legislature with this particular law. So in, in addition to sending it out to all of our represented groups, how is it shared with just staff generally at PPS, like unrepresented staff? Before it's second read? Well, during the 21 day comment period, isn't that when, don't, don't. I just wasn't sure if, okay. I, and I, I think I didn't hear the first part, if you were talking about before it was passed or at, second read or after, so. But. Well, we had a first reading, right? Yes, I'm with you. I just, they're, they're both questions might be relevant. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. So you'll, I'll... you'll get to the other one on your own. I don't need to lead you there. <laughs> so how do they get it? Or... There was no communication broadly to every employee about that policy change um, before it went to first reading. I, uh, all, PPS employees have some cog some level of understanding that the board meets and review the reviews these. I doubt many are checking that agenda. I would say, Julia, for a I mean, we we can't we don't currently have a practice of emailing every employee 
um, notice of policies that are about to take place. You know, they're about to be changed and are, are being first read. And here's the comment period. The represented employees represent a significant percentage of the population, but that's to their their unions, not to them directly. I also would say that when we have conforming statutory amendments that um, the, the, the greater utilities on the backside about, hey, you need to know this change happened. Um, but it's not it's not to deprive anyone of access to the comment period. So yeah, yeah, and I um, so you think it's of greater value once you have the new policy um, or was it when the statutory change was made, everybody was informed? No, there was not a broad communication when everybody was informed. Um, I, I think that there was not, not everyone was informed when the policy committee changed. Hey, Roseanne, can you send Claire the board, the materials for this meeting? Because I can't talk and do that at the same time. Yeah, so focus on answering Julia's question if you do that. Because um, it's a two-part question, or you made it a two-part question. Yeah, so um, I, I think the other thing is in this policy, many of the changes, in order to comply with it, the communications for someone who complains of workplace harassment, what's now required is more substantive content from the district. And so some of when you hear most about it is when you're involved in the process. But I mean, I think I, policy should be, sorry about the dog. Now I'm just like the perfect trifecta here. Multitasking, the dog, doorbell's gonna ring any minute. Um, when, um, uh, lost my train of thought. I don't know, I think that's enough. <laughs> okay, you were, you were, you were saying, a good answer. Um, Anyway, um, okay, so right. can, uh, can I just ask a follow-up question? Um, so have the, have our labor partners been informed of this? We've notified. Paula, sorry, where's Rachel? Rachel can speak to her process and timing. Let me not answer for her. She could have all the glory. We did send it to PAT because uh, part of this, uh, the CBA is that they received notice of it beforehand. And so we have done that once it's, once it leave, leaves the committee. Um, yeah. Rachel, Mary, can you your process as to the other partners? Um, well, we, uh, Ma um, Mary has been in contact with, with the engagement piece at the onset. And then the follow-up piece is that I believe Kara um, notifies the unions of these uh, agendas um, for the policy committee. And then once uh, policies or administrative directives are uh, final and approved, I send out a notification to uh, all of the union uh, presidents. So, th so that notification goes out after the policy has been approved or before? That is my piece of it, but Mary having worked on this uh, policy, the work workplace harassment policy has been in contact with those on the front end, I believe. And Kara sends agendas for the policy committee to all of the partners right. for visibility as well. Right. Okay. So I'm sorry, can I just, I'm going to ask Liz to finish her thought, um, because I think that you were midway through saying that uh, the, you, by the nature of it, it enhanced the, um, well, the guts of it enhances engagement and information when you're in the process. Um, are there portions of it, and again, so maybe for the non-represented empl employees, um, are there portions of it that would be important to know before you got into the process or is it the process is still the same process. It's just once you're in it, that's, that's now different. Well, I, I, I think the the process is in the eyes and experience of the employee going through it. So I think um, the, it's always helpful to know what to expect. I mean, I think that the, the real answer about, do you only are you only a beneficiary of the changed information at once you're in it 
And I think we would say holistically about if you, if there's a process available to you on the front end, you should know what it is and what you would experience. I mean, I think in a perfect world, Mary wants to say something. So well, I think that's part of the administrative directive. And and if you recall, at the last meeting, I was talking about um, I had we've done some engagement with Sharon and Human Resources because these changes. Um, are going to be uh, communicated via new procedure, you know. So this requires um, certain actions on our part, and how and and but it's not going to come at the policy level because I, I think that's less well. It's important, but I think that the how how you in, how you report how you take it like how how you walk through the process and what you can expect will be available to you is the it i think will be communicated once we have the administrative directed directive and um and and the sort of the changes to the hr process that's that's also part of this statute you know so there are um, requirements of a tickle system for example three months you know, i wouldn't use that term mary that's not the term we want to call it. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I'm not trying to be funny, funny actually. <laughs> Do not want to call it that. This, is not, this whole week is not going to go well. <laughs> but, but you know, there are different things in place that or that need, that need to also be put in place in terms of how we how we input uh, we we take in the information of uh reports of harassment and then how we support employees and uh conduct investigations and i think that's that's when we'll do the uh, you know some intensive communication about what that looks like was that a non-responsive answer <laughs> <laughs> Everybody was silent, and I was like, what does that mean? <laughs> no, thank you. Okay. Okay, so um, I guess uh, we are we're just in sort of a waiting mode. And um, Roseanne, do you know when this is on the agenda for a second reading? Is this? Uh, yeah, it's on the agenda for June 26th. Okay. Or 23rd, okay. whatever 23rd. the last meeting of the month. Yes, I'm stuck on the 26th, the 23rd. 23rd, okay. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so the next item is um, the long-awaited recommendations from OSCA for um, making some... Uh, efficiency changes to our policy portfolio. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to give the the kind of process overview about where we are in the the big process and then Rachel's going to introduce um, these specific policies. So you know many months ago we embarked, embarked on this uh, journey um, to conform where we thought it appropriate the OSBA policies or the PPS policies to the OSBA model policies in part so that we could update efficiently through their legislative updating process when uh, statutory changes have been made. And a lot of school districts around the state use the OSBA structure and numbering process and some of them just adopt all the- All of them, all, except us. Okay, all of them. Um, uh, with various levels of modification within them. Some are more customized for bigger districts than, than small sometimes because they have the capacity to do that. Um, so one of the one of the pieces that's been happening over the last several months and is still happening is mapping each of our policies to the OSBA policy. So that enables us to get the updates and even before we're through this process, know exactly where the change needs to be made if something's changed by statute down in Salem. Um, this, so we have the recommended changes from OSBA. You've been given in your, for this meeting, you know, the chunk of policies, and we've tried to make clear what OSBA recommended and what the staff recommended. 
I think um, as we've gone through this, and I'll, Rachel will talk more about that other part, but as we've gone through this, you know, we're, we're working through these policies not in order of priority or urgency to the district. We're working through them as they come through the section that we decided to start with. So um, some of what that means, I think very appropriately, is they are not the highest priority use for, in this case, the finance team, um, given everything, you know, in the middle of budget season. And so we are, we are very deferential. We, we are, we have, a, we have a long queue that we can push through the staff review process as there is capacity and appropriate prioritization of that work. There are other ways you could do it, but this is the start. And, and I guess the last thing I'll say before I hand it up to Rachel is one of the purposes of this is not just to have you see these policies, but I think in some ways more importantly to have you see what the process looks like and how we're approaching it. And then we can continue to be nimble and flexible and walk through that in some um, as, as you get to feel it and touch it and see it. So Rachel, why don't you talk about these specific pieces and then we can dive into that. Sure. Um, so yeah, as Liz said, I think this is a good uh, a, a good small section to walk you through and show you uh, what what they did and what it looks like um, cross mapping uh, the policies. And so in each uh, they the OSBA started with our section eight um, and the documents that you're looking at are just one part of our section eight. So in, in each of these sections, um, OSBA has included both the current district policy or administrative directive along with their recommendation. And on the first page, you can see the highlighted amount, the highlighted numbers are the ones that are included in this packet. And that was what we and staff were able to uh, to review thoroughly in order to present it to you. Um, if you scroll down to the third page, or actually it's fourth page, <clears throat> at the top of each of these documents, we've included the OSBA recommendation. And then underneath that, we've included Yes, staff recommendation, um, and these are the subject matter experts that are reviewing these. Uh, we've also included the OSBA code and the PPS policy number. So as you walk through these, you can see what, what is recommended and why. And I will just say uh, that the first policy, the contingencies and reserves policy, is not the one we recently adopted at PPS because we had sent this to OSBA almost a year ago. So um, that's why it, it doesn't appear as, as the current policy. Um, I think that's just a very broad highlight. Uh, if you want to take a look and ask questions, um, Claire and her staff work on this section and we will have more sections to come but we thought this would be uh, a nice, easy transition for all of us in this new uh, capacity that we're working with policies. So can I just clarify? Um, so in the, in the materials that we got, um, the policy that is here is not the current policy? Right. Uh, the reason for that is because we sent OSBA all of our documents um, before the current policy was adopted, and they had already begun working on that. Uh, I, I believe, though, that they would have they would have still recommended that we delete that policy and and adopt theirs, which uh, you know, based on on the work that we did and and. Um, you know Claire's uh, work on this that we would we would do that we would have the same recommendation. We would not recommend adopting OSBA's policy. We think ours is more appropriate for Portland Public Schools, and um, we would um, support the policy that is currently on the website that was ad adopted last June, a year ago. 
Okay. So, so I'm curious, do they tell us um, why they're proposed, why they want us to change besides like they think theirs is better or, I mean, is it, does it come along with, here's why we recommend this as sort of the model policy? I, I often find OSBA's policies are kind of generic and don't say a lot. Yeah, I think I think the they they, they don't specify um, unless they think our policy is okay with their revisions, and they may suggest some of their own revisions. But generally speaking, um, OSBA's uh, model is that it's legal and it's straightforward, and um, they they don't like a lot of flourish. Um, so they're just really cross mapping what they already have and know to be strictly compliant. Um, and that we, we understand as our school district, we may not elect to use those, um, those policies or, or we may elect to use them with our own edits. So for example, I think it's an important point um, in the, the philosophy of the OSBA policies which uh, we've heard over and over again, if it's not in a statute, if it's not in a regulation, if it's not articulated in case law as a legal standard, it does not belong in policy. And um, I, that is not the approach that this board has taken historically or in recent memory even. I think about this, the professional conduct policy as an example. There is, that is not, as when we get to that section, that will not be something OSBA has any commensurate policy for and therefore they do not recommend that it, it be kept. I, I don't I don't think that standard has a, a principle that matters. I think policy helps people understand what the rules of the game are. It protects decision makers, it protects employees uh, and students. And so there are times when you have policies at the policy level, but even when they're not grounded in positive statements in statute regulation or case law. Sorry, Rachel, for the editorializing. I'll hand it back to you. No, that's great. That's great. I think that, I hope, Julia, does that help? Um... It does. So essentially, do you think there'd be any cases where they don't say recommend delete policy and replace with um, theirs? If, if, there, if theirs is like, we're trying to get everybody standardized? I think there may be those cases. Uh, we'll have to, we'll have to, look at those as they come. Um, I, I, in this section, I believe uh, there was one of our uh, policies or, AD, or ADs that they recommended that we keep with their revision. I would have to look through here. Um, but I, I think though, more often than not, their philosophy is going to be, you should replace what you have with what we have. And they understand also that we can elect not to do that, or we can maybe take certain language and insert it or delete certain language in our current policies. Um, it's really, it's really what, what, what the board wants to do um, on a case by case um, based on staff expertise. And it's not just board policy. They're also looking at the ADs. Yes, they're looking at ADs also. So in this in this packet, for example, uh, they have recommended that we delete uh, a current AD, and uh, we agree. Or Claire agreed with that recommendation. So it's also cleaning up some things too that we we don't need. Okay, I, I don't know if you want me to dive right in, but I disagree with that. Uh, not with you. But I disagree with OSBA saying we don't, I mean, to me, I guess I look at, I think of my interactions with OSBA and generally it's an organization that's more dominated by smaller districts. And I think they have different needs and different community values. And um, ordinarily when we have something that's fairly detailed is because it's something that our community felt strongly about in terms of values um, and that in a lot in what what may be okay to have an informal system in a smaller district like if it's not in statute we don't need to say it in larger districts you may need them um, 
so my my philosophy in general would my approach to this would be more to utilize them primarily to be connecting using their numbering system so we can catch up on the revised statutes versus using them to replace our policies or ADs that we may need because we're a different district than a lot of other OSBA districts. That just my point of view and from looking at sort of the initial run of the documents. And I think that was the direction that the board gave to staff last year or when, when we started all of this. So um, I, I don't, I haven't heard anything that suggests to me that that approach has changed at all, right? That we're sort of taking OSBA's input under advisement, but um, ultimately, we're gonna we're gonna do what we're gonna do. Yes. Correct. Okay. Okay. So, um, so this first policy on um, contingencies and reserves, and the existing policy, I believe, I just pulled it up. Um, it's called reserve funds. Um, so. The staff recommendation is that we uh, just keep the policy we currently have. Are there any objections to that? Is the uh, highlighted ORS because we're actually going to drop that in, or what? Is 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 that what is that the one change we assuming that assuming that our new one actually has a reference? <laughs> To it, would, is that what we'd be doing? Just dropping in the ORS? Uh, I'll have to go back and look at what okay, our current. The ORS is already in there, right? But this isn't this isn't our policy, right? Okay, so the 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 policy that is in the documents that were sent that is not the um, existing policy. It's um, we we changed it. We revised the policy after we sent this text to OSBA. So the current right. policy does have an ORS has several ORS numbers in there. So that we'd be adopting it. So when I look at the policy that's on the web, that's the current policy. It has the same statutes listed at the bottom of the policy. They're referenced. Right. I think, Julie, just to your point, the question of the highlighted text in the policy we're not recommending be adopted is just an errant highlight. It doesn't mean anything. Okay. Okay, so um, so the staff recommendation is um, say thank you very much, but no thanks to the OSBA recommendation, right? That is correct. Okay. Um, are there any objections? Okay. Um, can I just make one sort of editorial comment? I kind of like the introduction that they have in the OSDA policy, but probably not enough to suggest that we revise our existing policy. So, I'm good keeping it the way it is. Okay, so are, are board members okay with that? So the recommendation is no change. I mean, yep. the committee's recommendation is no change. Okay, all right, next policy is um, on a budget committee um, and PTS staff's recommendation is to decline to adopt um, because uh, this is responsive to a statute that applies to smaller districts but not to PTS. So we have our own statute that says the board acts as the budget committee and that there isn't a separate budget committee. 
And you have, um, through policy, uh, created the Community Budget Review Committee as well. But this this language is what um, it's in. <clears throat> it's an ORS for um, smaller districts to operate that way, where there's a 14 member budget committee, seven members are the board, seven members are community members, and then they vote together to approve the budget. Statutorily, PPS does not do that. So we and have our, a separate ORS that addresses our size. So this would not align to the current statute for PPS. Can you can you clarify whether that statute applies to districts in addition to PPS? I don't know the populations of the other. It's based on population of the um, district. So, and I, I'm I know Liz, you and I looked this up. Was it four hundred thousand? I can't remember. I'm sorry, I don't remember. We looked at it a year ago or so. Okay. No. I, I'm just curious because I I would like us to identify statutes that have a universe of one meaning up and and um there this is all um government local government agencies so there are other local government agencies that um would be in our population city of portland for instance okay okay All right, so again, the uh, the staff recommendation is uh, thanks, but no thanks. Well, um, we'd be outside of the statute by doing, by adopting this policy. We would not, uh, we would be not following statute. Okay, well, we can still thank them for their work, but <laughs> yes. no thank you. For their standard okay. policy that works for most districts, yes. <laughs> okay, um, okay to move on? All right. Uh, the next, the next document is an administrative directive that staff is recommending deletion, and that is a superintendent call. Um, so it, it seems reasonable to me. Um, so I don't think we really need to weigh in on that. Actually, I'd like to have a discussion about that because when I read through this, I think. This is a really important transparency, especially this year in which we're going to have the budget less than, you know, three weeks. And, and, and we've all acknowledged we're going to have an ongoing probably series of potential changes to the budget. I'm not quite sure why it's not in policy, but because to me it. It, it seems like it sets out a process for when you have a significant change in the budget, which is one of the board's primary responsibilities. So I, I would say this is the, exactly the year that we shouldn't be deleting it because we most likely should have a, a process by which we share transparently with the community what changes are being made. So is that already covered in policy, Claire? So what what I would say is that it's the when you look at statute about what the role of the board is and what the role of um, administration. So the role of the board is to adopt the budget at the appropriation level by fund, and this gets into program and service level, which is really the administrative role. And so um, it it doesn't mean that we don't communicate and inform, but it. it there isn't, um, it, it's, the work is done by the administrative, by statute, it's administrative work rather than um, the appropriation level work that boards are expected to do. I just disagree um, in the sense of the board's obligation. So having been through, again, this year is a great example. Like we will not have the budget for you know, barely for two to three weeks, we all acknowledge that there's going to be a whole series of changes. And um, to me, this lays out a very transparent process about how reductions would be made and how communications happen. Um, and so I, I, I think it would be um, a difficult year to be 
taking out a framework for how and how the the board is going to be informed of pretty significant changes and I don't think we ever look at like we're just approving like fund or line item X, but um, and that's not how the budget gets presented to us either. It gets presented to us many times as a program. Here's what we're like the pro the programs that we're um, going to be funding and the staffing levels. So Claire, can you explain um, if we deleted this um, administrative directive, what would the process be for any um, reallocation of funds that were already approved? How how does that work? How does the notification to the board happen? Um, and what kind of authority does the have? Does the board have? over oversight. So it, the board's oversight is in the approval of the budget and in the adoption of the budget. This is an unfortunate set of circumstances this year where it's unlikely that we will have the information from Salem um, in time to um, approve and adopt the budget. We're um, scheduled to approve on June 11th and then adopt on June 22nd. Um, we have, um, excuse me, I think it's, is it June 23rd, whatever the Tuesday is. Um, so, and we know the legislature is, um, we're hearing this scheduling is from June 22nd to July 4th. Statutorily, we have to have a budget adopted by June 30th. We've scheduled with TSCC six months ago for that June 23rd date, and changing that to a different date would be difficult to do. We are required to have that budget hearing with the TSCC um, before the board adopts the budget. So we have an unfortunate set of timings this year, and it's not something that I would expect to be the norm. Uh, having the pandemic event um, occur in March and where it has totally disrupted our local economy and changed the, um, we are now where there are revenue shortfalls for the next coming year. And so uh, because we are a large district and need to staff in time for school to open in August, uh, we need the time to um, work through the many levels of um, you know, people in the organization to um, either reduce the position, transfer a staff member. I mean, so there's a lot of pieces that have to happen and it takes a good six week process to do that. And if we wait till that very end to do all this, we won't be able to get that work done. So in, but this year is a timing problem. We do, um, in terms of, in terms of, so you asked for communication and you also asked for um, what the oversight role is. And so the oversight role is the approval and adoption of the budget. But it's also post um, if there's any uh, budget transfers that need to be made, where it's over the certain percentage, I think it's 15% um, or certain dollar amount, then we come back to the board to reappropriate to make appropriation transfers. So for instance, if the if right now we have project predictions on how much SIA funding we'll have, but if the legislature moves some of that from SIA into general fund, then we would have to come back to board um, um, for the authority to um, reappropriate items, revenue in the general fund, and then um, lower the appropriation in the SIA funding. So it just depends on legislative action when it goes across funds from general fund to special revenue, then we have to come back for board action. And it's again, based on that appropriation level, that fund, and then the major function, which is like 1,000 for instruction, 2,000 for support services, things like that. Okay, and, and if, um, can, if, if you're not talking, can you please mute? There's a lot of background noise. Um, so in the absence of this administrative directive, um, 
what is it that requires the kind of um, uh, board action that you just talked about? What, so we, we believe that it's important to inform our, our board of what, what the changes are anticipated in, in the upcoming budget as you are about to approve and adopt the budget. So we're going to continue to give you up-to-date information as we go forward. And even after we've met that June 30th deadline um, of adopting a budget, we will continue to inform as we um, hear more from the, the legislature. So I guess I'd have two things. One, this is about post-budget adoption allocate reallocations, um, just not before, but this is also the second year in a row. So as you recall, last year, we because of all the change in the finance staff, we got the budget at the last minute. We had to ask TSPC for an extension, and we passed it right at the, the end. Um, so I, I'm just, we've had two years in which we've gotten the information really at at the very end, but th this was specific AD relates to reallocation after the budget's been been adopted, and I guess I, I'm trying to see what in here is a, is objectionable. It in because to me it lays out a framework that the community and staff and the board could understand if there's significant budget reductions how they're going to be done and and how they're communicated. Well, I think that it's important for administration to be able to modify um, processes as uh, especially when we're responding to a recession or recovering from a recession, so that we we always will re in, inform the board, right? We will always um, bring you know, our financial reporting to you. And so I think it's important that we work with board leadership as, as we're planning for the year and, and have expectations on, like right now we have quarterly financial reports coming to the board with projections through the end of the year. And th those are um, things that haven't been in place in this district for quite some time. Even when this AD was in place, I can tell you that not every piece of it was followed. And I think it's unusual for uh, <clears throat> when there's a program shift need that's usually responded to by administration, it doesn't mean that we don't inform, but it's not that we need um, approval to do so. That's usually in the administration's um, work to do that. So in my 20 years with PPS, whenever we've been in a cut scenario, which is we have been often, The administration working with the board and the community and having a high level of transparency um, is been, I think, what has created an atmosphere in which we've had a lot of community support for even in budget cutting years for whether it was a local option or bonds or income tax surcharges. Um, and there's hardly anything that gets cut in a district that doesn't engender some um, that doesn't have some impact on students. And um, I say, I, I don't feel like in the situation in which we have a budget that we're going to have for, you know, less than three weeks, and we'll have probably three days in which we understand what the cuts are, and then to say, well, you've adopted the budget. So at this point in time, we're just going to inform the board going, going forward, especially if there's pretty significant potential reductions. I mean, obviously, um, the district can, it's, it's, it's an AD, so you can delete it. I, I th think it would be um, not a wise thing to do in this particular, so this Julia, particular year. Is what you're concerned about that if we don't have this, uh, this AD, that we don't then have like a systemic way to ensure that the superintendent is reporting to the board the budget cuts? Is that Correct. Your uh, yes. I am so concerned that we need about this that. To sort of make sure that it's within the, the system that those cuts will be reported to the board. Well, I think it's best best practice. Like I say, I think there's a lot of things that um, um, it's way better to do with the community understanding the cuts and the priorities and the trade offs that have been made. Mm -hmm. um, so, are there, that, question is, are there other systemic ways? that we have like in policy or in ADs that, that mandate that the superintendent 
engage with the board or the public around that. I'm sorry, I'm not, not sure if I understand your question. So what I'm so, hearing say is the reason you don't want this AD deleted is because you want to ensure that there's a systemic way to make sure that the board is being informed of cuts. Right, because for, for example, we have, we, have a state, we have a law that lays out how the board is to get the budget. And I feel like, you know, we may be following, you know, the, the letter of the law, but I don't, I, I, I barely feel informed, you know, of, like, like we don't actually have the budget yet that we're being asked to, right. to approve. And we're not going to get it till th or the community till three days before we're actually being asked, asked to vote on it. And so then right. it's like, Hey, you, you approved it. So now, you know, if we change things around, and like there's no particular I'm process. Trying ask, I'm trying to ask Claire a question, which is. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were asking me. Well, no, I asked you the first question. Then okay. my second question sorry. Was <laughs> so I just wanted to check like what your concern was. And so my question to Claire is, do we have anything else in, and maybe Liz can help answer this too, in statute or in policy that would answer Director Brim Edwards' concern around, are there systemic sort of guardrails on ensuring that the board is informed and what are those? So one thing, I, the AD is set up in a structure for a committee that doesn't exist right now. And so so that's when I read through the um, administrative director, it doesn't align to how we're operating. And that's one of the reasons I would recommend um, deleting it is because it is set up in a structure that we're not living in. And it's hard to follow it when um, we don't have that that um, that setup. I I um, the statute has um, at appropriation level. That's when the um, we need board action um, when it's over. When we're gonna um, if we're needing to spend in, in a higher amount, it actually does not talk about. Um, if it's reduced, we, we just, we underspend. Um, it is part of operational when you work through the school year while you budget, you're making decision, decisions in January and February to plan for the next year. A year later, in the next January, there might be the difference of what's needed and what was planned for the year before. And so it's, quite common for administration to manage a budget throughout the year to stay within the appropriation levels that have been um, set up by the board. I also think it's best practice, I agree with Julia, in that communicating to the board and the community what our changes are, and that's the purpose of our financial reports and the variance report that we give on a quarterly basis. So what I heard you say, Claire, is that um, when we're within the appropriations, there is no necessarily reporting. And that part of the problem with this AD is that it's based on a structure that doesn't fit what our actual practices are right now. Mm -hmm. And then other ways, like if there are going to be significant budget changes, how how is that communicated to the board? Like I'm assuming if the board approves the budget, Guadalupe can't just decide to like move a million dollars into um, hula hoop for PE at Creston. So, okay, what so I, if, you're, if you're not speaking, can you please mute yourself? There's a lot of background noise. Sorry. So, if it's within the 1,000, so if he decides instead of um, $50,000 in music instruments, he's going to buy math manipulatives instead, that he'd be allowed to make that decision based on budget law, because it's still within that 1,000 function level. But if you use a million dollars that was supposed to go to uh, putting a new parachute-based roof on BESC and move that million dollars to buying hula hoops for Preston, like that, that would need to go before the board, correct? It would because it would cross um, the function level. One is support services or capital for putting the parachute above BESC. And then the, um, the so that would need uh, an appropriation change to the 1000 inspection level. So I don't know if any of that answers your question, Julia, about like 
are there systemic places where significant budget changes are reported to the board or if you still feel like this ad is needed because of the, the build down level but then my question is we still need to see how do we deal with the fact that it isn't actually workable because the committee reference is not functioning well i think that's pretty easy to remedy um you could put in probably a better, better policy anyway to not have a, a committee name, but you could have a, either the board or, a, you know, you could, you could use language. You could replace the finance audit, audit and operations committee with either the board or the board or it's, you know, a designated committee. So that that's easily remedied. Um, but I guess the other thing I look at is, you know, in 5B, it actually gets approved by the board. And so, that would be a significant change that we're just going to inform you quarterly of changes we've made. Um, so I, I guess I don't view the budget exercise as a, you're just one and done. And I, I feel like there has been really very little interaction with the board around just in this particular year. And it's going to be very volatile that I don't feel like, hey, when I, when I vote yes on, you know, both on approval and adoption, that like, okay, we can change, we can change programs if cuts need to be made because I believe those um, are more than just an administrative, um, more than an administrative action, often they have programmatic or policy related implications. The contingency transfer would be an appropriation transfer, so that would require board approval in how we operate now. So that that would um, so that's in statute, and that's so that is something that we already we would already bring to you if we were doing our contingency transfer we'd need your approval before we move the money to another part of the budget so it looks like three or four um four c also has board approval so this would be a limiting board approval of um major expenditure reductions So if we're having a major expenditure reduction, I don't just want to read about in the quarterly report. Can I ask a, 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 a different kind of question? Um, so this is an administrative directive. Is, it, is there a policy to which it is related? Yeah, it, it's related to, I don't have the exact Psyche, but it, it sits underneath the process that's defined by policy that Claire's been talking about. We brought it here as part of the demonstration of what the OSBA process is. So that was the that's the reason you're seeing this here in this first rollout, so that you can you have visibility to what this is looking like as staff is working through this first tranche of uh, OSBA pieces. Okay, I, I get that, but. What what is the policy that governs this AD? I'll find it. Because there might be something already in the policy that addresses the concern. And, and well, I'm not finding it. The AD under the purview of the superintendent. So if the superintendent wants to delete an AD, can't he just do that? Um, I yeah, I think technically yes, but um I'm so every AD is supposed to be related to a policy and um so I'm looking through the policies on here and I'm it, not finding a, I'm not finding anything about adoption of the budget beyond a, a very a very thin definition of the role of the Board of Education. It's called budget amendments DBI. And if you keep scrolling down, you'll see it in the packet. Okay. 
we don't we don't have this policy now. This is a recommendation from OSBA, and it's something that we are recommending it be be approved. The only staff edit was an option. Oh, I see. Okay, so the, so the next document it is it would be an addition that would talk about budget amendments. Yes, and the only event, there were two options there of whether you're in a biennial budget or an annual budget. So we struck the language regarding the biennial budget because we do our budget annually. Okay, so Julia, have you looked at this? Yeah, I don't think this says very much. <laughs> I mean, 10% of estimated expenditures. So for this current budget, that would be 72 million. Is that correct? Well, wait a minute. Is it 10% of estimated expenditures in, in, a, in a particular for each, category or for across each. the board? It's not by fund, it's by appropriation level. So it'd be 1,000 function for instruction, 2,000 right. function for support services, our example. Okay. Okay, but it'd be millions of dollars. In the general fund, that is correct. In capital project, that is also correct. Yeah. I'm not okay. saying Anyway, I'm not I'm not supportive of eliminating it, and I um, it's obviously the superintendent's call of where they want to have it. I think it would be in a year in which we're going to see major reductions, um, a huge a huge mistake to um, have major expenditures and reductions occur without board approval. Because frankly, they are they're not administrative. Um, having having lived through millions of dollars in reductions, um, having the board tell the community we don't have anything to do with it because there it's an administrative action. When you're closing schools, closing programs, laying off staff, you know, doing a whole host of things, um, it 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 won't feel administrative. It won't feel like an administrative function. And again, I think our budget process this year is, um, it, it, I mean, it is what it is because of the year, but the reality is there's going to be no substantive board engagement with the, with, with the budget um, in the brief period of time we, we have the final budget, which we don't yet have. Okay. Um can I can I make a suggestion here? Um, how about we we put aside the administrative directive and um, and look at the two policies that are being recommended for adoption. One is on budget amendments, and one is for budget transfer authority. Um, because it seems to me that these are. Um, directly related to the administrative directive we're talking about, right? Yes, that is, that is correct. Those are both related to the conversation we just had. Okay, so let's, um, let's take a look at these two. And first of all, can you, um, Julia, can you please mute? The, I'm, your, I'm sorry. Oh, yes. Okay. Um, so the, my first question is, uh, uh, for us non-fiscal people, can you explain the difference between budget amendment and budget transfer authority? Claire, you're on mute. I have to do that every meeting, right? At least once. Um, so 
a budget amendment is where you might be increasing the budget, where a transfer authority is where you're moving things from one function level to another, from instruction to support services, or from support services to instruction. So it doesn't mean the money is, there isn't more money, um, but there we need to move it from one appropriation level to another. That would be the transfer authority. And we, um, statutorily, it's by the 1,000, 2,000 level instruction and support services rather than the 100 salaries, 200 benefits. We have, those are our um, account code structures that we're, are designated to us by the Oregon Department of Ed. So the Department of Revenue from the state also is the one that um, dis, uh, distinguishes our appropriation levels, right? So between those two state agencies, they give us direction um, on what we need to do. So the authority is more about increasing the budget overall, where the transfer is moving money around within the budget you already have. Okay. Um, okay, so in the budget amendment draft, um, it says the amount of estimated expenditures for each fund in an annual budget may not be increased by more than $5,000 or 10% of the estimated expenditures, whichever is greater. Okay. Um, there's no mention of a decrease. If there's a limit on the amount um, a fund can be increased, but but no mention of a decrease. Okay. Usually, when it's a decrease, we don't come back to the board. We manage the budget and spend less, and we respond. Usually. Usually when there's a dis decrease, there isn't, um, that could be maybe we budgeted for a grant that we're not going to receive. So then that means we don't spend that, right? We didn't receive the grant. The, um, in general fund, it can mean, um, I remember in the eight, nine year that um, we, with each economic forecast, we had changes in the anticipated revenue. And as it continued to go down, we had to continue to make decisions on how to balance the budget. So that um, we managed within our, our resource level. And those takes those took negotiations with employee contracts and we had to move quickly in order to um, meet the um, immediacy of the decline in resources. So typically you don't decrease, in, um, you don't come back to the board for a decrease in budget unless you're trying to transfer it from one place to another to spend it somewhere else. What if you're what if you're making a programmatic reduction? Um, usually programs I I have not had I'm trying to think of an experience where um, we have reduced a program mid year. Usually we're so cyclical on um, school year and fiscal year. Um, significant changes um, usually in program usually comes through the budget process and it's not something um, I'm, I'm trying to imagine what that might be. Do you have an example? Like well, I, I guess, um, well, from my, from 2003, we cut tons of things between the beginning of the year and the, and the end of the year. Um, so lots of examples from that. Um, so I, I guess I, I don't see, I, I guess I'm going to go back to Rita's original question about these two policies. Um, I think they sort of fail the plain English um, test. The fact, I mean, to, to me that these would be, um, and that this isn't the criticism of anybody at PPS. It's just that they're, they're the OSBA policies, but I, I don't, I don't know that this is me meaningful. When I look at the AD, to me, I understand um, in plain English of what what we're going to be doing when we're 
making, you know, changes are being made and it's very clear what the process is. Um, so usually so, when there's a decrease in resources or um, where we need to decrease our budget, usually that's a budget management by administration during the year. It's not usually something that um, comes back to the board. So for me, Julia, this still continues to go back to that question about, I mean, what I think you're fundamentally asking about is this fear that there will be significant reductions made and the board won't be part of that process and that you feel like the best way to deal with the situation that's unfolding with um, the COVID-19 and the reductions we'll be facing is to have board buy-in and is to have community buy-in. Right, because I think that is what has over the years resulted in the community being supportive of, of so, us. And, you know, I think if it's not in policy, then, you know, I don't know that it necessarily needs to come from a place of policy, but how do we, how do we make that happen? So is that, you know, is there a, a way for us to work with staff to make an agreement around how we do this work? Is there... Is it covered in other policies? Um, but I think it's not so much about the words on the paper, but it's about the fundamental sense of we want the board to be an integral part of these conversations going forward. Well, well, to, well I, I did raise this the other day, and I can't remember if it was at the meeting or in sort of our briefing, but to, to me, this is, I don't know why we'd need to create something else. This works just, to me, this works just fine um, because it's clear what the different what the different roles are, what the reporting is, and I I do I am concerned about an informal process because informal processes and you know we got the the document you know the day before our our board meeting and we still don't have the final version and and it's I don't I don't feel comfortable voting to adopt the budget and then knowing that we're going to have significant reductions and then we're going to go negotiate something or we're going to get a quarterly report of what the reductions reductions are. Um, we have actually spoken about bringing back in detail back to the, the board about um, what after the legislature um, so that all along we've been reporting that we would come back to the board in detail about what changed after the legislature made whatever changes they made. So we anticipate not just giving a quarterly financial report, but we, we are um, ex expecting to come back to the board with a report on um, how we are, manage the um, reductions or the any changes that were done legislatively. And, and Quite frankly, some of the things they could do could require board action in terms of appropriation, either um, tr transfer or um, most likely transfers. Well, then, what what's if if we're planning on doing that? Why wouldn't we just use this process? I mean, that the whole the committee doesn't exist anymore. I think we could that that's an easily remedied addition. But I I don't like. What, what would be wrong with using this process? I think I'd need further review of it to, um, cause I went through it and I saw so many problems with it about how we currently operate. I just said, just get rid of it. It's not, it's not an AD that I've had in um, other places I've worked, but it doesn't mean that we can't have something here, but it just, um, it, it didn't align to how we operate now. Can I ask a question about um, budget amendment? So we periodically, um, two or three times a year, usually two, um, we get a request to uh, amend the adopted budget mm -hmm. um, based on you know how things evolve over the year. Um, what is? Do we currently have a policy that requires that? Well, there's state statute that requires it because of the appropriation level change. So this spring, we brought one to you, an amendment, because we were going out for a bond sale, because we recognized it was a good time, the interest rates were in our favor, and we were um, 
we could have done it in in the fall of um, 2020, but we opted to move it up sooner because we recognized the historically low interest rates and thought that would be a benefit be of benefit to the district and the community. And so we brought it forward as a supplemental budget to so that we could make that sale in the spring rather than the fall. So that's an example of why we do a budget amendment. Okay, and that's un, that's authorized by statute or required by statute. We needed appropriation in our capital projects um, fund in order to make that bond sale. So that is a requirement that the board would need to appropriate those funds for us to, to engage in that bond sale. Okay, so um, it's, it's four minutes to six. Um, I, I don't think we're going to resolve anything today here. Um, so I'm, I'm going to make a request. Maybe this will help. Um, would it be possible to get an, an actual like memo on what, um, on, on the two policies and the AD? Um, and it would be helpful to know what is it about the AD that is problematic? Um, and what um, and I guess why do we need these two policies? Um, and I, I think I'm just going to speak for me. I'm a little confused about what our current budgetary authority is or what our current mechanism for budgetary oversight and where we derive the authority for that. Um, it's because so we approved the budget and by PTS policy. Does that make sense? Yeah, so it is, you're absolutely correct. Actually, it's you know, the adoption of the budget, and then any time that we need to um, change appropriations from what you adopted as a budget over a, a, um, when we need to, to increase at a, an appropriation level, we need to bring that to the board. Anytime we transfer, we never spend from contingency, we always have to move it to what we're spending it for. And anytime we're doing a contingency transfer, we would also need to bring that to the board. Rita, just a, a question. Um, just given where we are with the budget over the next month, does this seem like something that would be better for us to do during the summer versus having Claire put together or whoever it is having to put together the policy about the budget? Well, that's a good question. Um, I'm, I'm Claire. I'm guessing you guys have a few things going. Um, Very much so appreciated if we delayed until after the budget was adopted. Okay, so let me just ask one question. Is there anything in here that you feel we must do reasonably quickly? Everything we're doing is by statute already and we follow statute, so. Okay. Okay, so so I think we can, I mean, I'm okay with postponing it until after we get through June. Um, and Claire is nodding. So, Ailey, any objections? And, and she's shaking her head no. Okay, so why don't we do that? So we'll just kind of put a hold on all of this. Um, and then um, when you bring it back, I think it would be helpful to have some kind of some kind of staff memo that sort of lays out what this is all about, why you're making these recommendations, what we currently have and don't have. Anyway, get some kind of context to it so that we really have a better understanding of what we're talking about. Thank you. I think that's really sane and um, on Claire's behalf, appreciate the offer to, to wait till after the budget's adopted. I, and I don't. Yeah, okay. I, I, so, I, so that could be problematic. I don't know that we really aspire to change. So. Oh yes, you do. 
No, I want <laughs> I okay. want you to aspire to sane. We all need to aspire okay. to sane. Yeah, speak for the, yourself. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing I'd ask that, that we just think about from this OSBA process, Having been through one small chunk that had a variety of things, amend this, delete this, add that, here's an example of an AD, staff member would be helpful here. I don't think every single OSBA document requires a staff memo, but some does. Don't, let's not, it's six o'clock, so I'm not inviting robust conversation now, but I think we should think about what, chew on this and how we, you know, have iterative improvement to this process and what's the way to move these through. And some things that might seem perfunctory to staff actually have great policy or substantive resonance with the board. And so um, it's not about developing hard and fast rules in our next meeting, but I would welcome at our next meeting some of your reflections on how we move these. We, this process is gonna be long on a good day. So what's the, how do we think about you know what that looks like and what's most efficient and how do we if, if there's any prioritization to be done how we think about that so food for thought for the next meeting so can i ask a question about that yeah Go ahead. does osba require that we do things in a certain order if we, so if we said say they sent 10 things back and we're like hey you got five of these like we agree with them just book it but like these other five like either we're not interested in spending the time or the bigger thing. So we want to move on to the next chapter and give us the next 10. Will they let, would they let us do that? Or are they dogmatic in there? You got to get through the first 10 and then we give you the next 10. No, we, we, we own the process there. I mean, we, we can't get ahead of what the work they haven't done, but they're way ahead of us. So um, I'm not, I'm not worried about that. So I think we should consider setting our own agenda as the, as the way forward. So, so just to clarify, we have a, are you saying that um, this is just the first chunk and there are a bunch of other things already in the queue? Yes. Okay. Okay. Good to know. Um, all right. So, um, if talk with all um, our own process, um, and if Liz, if you could give us some um, some clue about what policies are, are already in the hopper that we're going to need to look at and well the, the, I, this list right we've been working through um, what you got here these are okay. working their way through the finance team again this is not the time of the year to have the finance team do this work so right. but they are mm -hmm. but this is where we've where we've started in this section or chapter eight or section D of OSBA. And, and I'll add, oh, this is Rachel. I'll add that that's the only section we currently have from OSBA. They're working okay. on the remaining sections. Okay. I thought we had more than that, Rachel. That's my mistake. I, I really thought that we had several from the past, uh, from other sections, not all, but some. So that, sorry, Rita, I did not mean to mistake that. That's my misunderstanding. Okay. I know they're working on on them um, now, uh, but this is this is the only one that I have been made aware of, I believe. So I think if maybe where I misunderstood. Else, no, they map they map them all first, right? They align ours to the um, to their coded sections, and that work is the first step. And then, as I if I understand it, and Rachel, correct me if I'm wrong. Then they go back and make the policy by policy right. recommendations. And so I know they have gotten through the bulk of that mapping, if not all of it, and then okay. now they're doing that. So yeah, and we can tell them what order we want them to go in um, as they work through that as well. So this, the first two and a half pages of this thing, these are the policies and ADs that they've already cranked out. Yes, that at some point that's we're correct. Gonna Okay. okay. And Thank some you. of these, uh, the reason we only gave you the highlighted section um, today is because we still need uh, staff follow up and questions on the remaining policies. Um, and staff has not, you know, of course, been able to do meet that criteria right now. It's not a priority. So we'll, we'll continue to work through that. But we wanted to give you something to take a look at today and okay. and and I think maybe we'll we'll consider putting on our next agenda the 
reflections and feedback on what might work better. Okay. All right. Cool. Sounds good. Um, I have more to come. It's very exciting. Uh, okay. So we are now at 6.05. So um, apologies for going over. And um, unless anybody has anything else, I, I think we are... I told Jeff not to have dinner ready till 6.30, just in case this meeting maybe was going to go long. So you've got 25 more minutes by my clock, Rita. <laughs> uh, yes, I'm seeing some head shakes from others. So I think we will. Thank you for the offer, but I think we're going to uh, respectfully decline. And um, so this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>